Rod, our Mesumeriaman, Ramses II in Abu Simbel in Egypt, in uh, Africa. I have to say that now because a lot of people think Egypt is in the Middle East. Uh, I remember as I came to the end of our tour that year, the ancestors spoke to me and said, go back and tell them. Even if they don't want to hear what you got to say, go back and tell them that we are not dead. We are alive and we are well. And brothers and sisters, I tell you, man, it's like once you acknowledge the ancestors and their reality, it helps you to have a, a different energy, helps you to have another power level in your life because you're remembering from whom you came. You see, that, that's, that's what they, they don't want you to know that. They don't want you to know, you know, you take people like Arnold Toynbee and other Eurocentric historiographers who want you to believe that Africans have not made any significant contribution to civilization. They tell you that we didn't really do anything, you know, and they want you to think that civilization began with the Greeks and all that sick, twisted mentality. But once you understand that it really comes from us you know and look at somebody and say you're not a descendant of Africa you are an ascendant of Africa see descend means to go down see when we start thinking up then we'll start living up y'all follow what I'm saying okay and we come from an awesome people you know and, and it's a little discouraging when you think about how awesome our people were and you look around and see what we're doing today. Uh, don't get me wrong, I, I, I love our ancient ancestors and their accomplishments, their life, their deeds, their legacy, their contributions. That's why I wrote the oath to the ancestors that we say here and everywhere else around the diaspora, people are beginning to say it. But I am not disillusioned with the concept or the, the truth of the matter that we were great at one time. Did y'all hear what I just said? We were great at one time. And it's an exercise in futility for us to keep thinking about how great we were and doing nothing with it now. So we got to come out of the jails. We got to come out of the prisons. We got to come off the street corners. We got to come out of the crack houses. You know, it's deep because you got a lot of folk in the situations I just explained can tell you all about ancient Egypt. But how is it affecting their life right now? It's not doing anything. So we got to make it real now. Y'all hear what I'm saying? That kind of ties into the message I have for today. But before actually going into the message, I want to read uh, a blog from a Facebook friend and one of my listeners and her name is Alberta Parrish so bear with me as I read her blog because I feel good about the fact of what she has to say in her blog and you can go to my Facebook page and read this for yourself but here's what it says uh, the, the title of her blog is the mythology of Christianity and Christ by Alberta Parrish. Looks like a warrior sister here too, according to her picture. I'm serious, man. Here's what she says. She says, on April 1st, 2011, was the last day I attended church as a Christian. Today is one year, the one year anniversary in which I cut ties with religious indoctrination. The last night I attended my church, I knew then that I would not be returning as a born again Christian. My mom is still Christian. And of course, she has requested to be funeralized in a church. In the event that I return to a church in order to funeralize my mom, it certainly won't bother me because my mind has been set free from religious enslavement. 
I can sit there with a straight face and know that what the minister is preaching is historically incorrect and based on ancient mythology. I could possibly have a conversation with this same minister and tell him or her why I am an atheist. I come across Christians all the time. Therefore, I am not offended by their religious rhetoric and nonsense because I know that they just don't know any better. Before I read any further, I'm going to communicate with her and let her know Africans can't be atheists. But I understand what she's saying. See, in other words, once you have been disillusioned by religion, people readily claim the title of being an atheist. Everybody repeat after me. An atheist, an atheist is a person who does not believe or trust in the existence of God or the Almighty. Africans can't be atheists. It's not in our DNA. Okay? So really what's happening here is in her transition, she's still seeing Jesus as God. You follow what I'm saying? And the African story is that God is. Jesus is not. Did that make sense? Let me finish what she wrote here. My transitioning from Christianity began with research on the origin of Christianity in 2010. Because I wanted to prove the validity of a historical Jesus as being the true savior of mankind who was resurrected from the dead. Instead, I found evidence that disproves the existence of Jesus as a Jewish historical figure. Let me start by saying that there could never have been a Jewish man named Jesus in the first century. The term Jew did not even originate until the 18th century. She did her homework. The letter J was never part of the Hebrew or Aramaic alphabet. The term Jew was originally used to denote the term Judean. In earlier versions of the Bible, Judean was the official term in earlier versions of the Bible before it was replaced with the term Jew, which was first seen in the New Testament King James Version in the 18th century. A Judean, you notice how I'm saying that, a Judean, because there was no J, was a resident of the ancient occupied territory by the Romans known as Judea. The Roman providence Judea comes from the Greek Eudaia. The letter J is an English letter acquired from the French. I love it when people go do their homework. And is a derivative of the Latin languages. All so-called historical accounts outside the Bible of the first and second centuries containing the name Jesus in reference to him being the Jewish Savior Messiah are historical forgeries. Christianity was indeed invented by Romans in the first century AD. The account given by Flavius Josephus a Jewish Roman historian concerning Jesus is nothing more than a sophisticated forgery. Because Josephus was a pen name for a man named Arius Calpurnius Piso. I love it. A Roman aristocrat who, according to Arthur Albalard Ruklin, had written the four Gospels, the Pauline writings, and the book of the Revelation, along with other members of his family. Everybody say the Piso Papers. I don't know how many of you guys ever heard of that before. I've talked to you about it several years ago. Right? And the Piso family are the people who wrote the New Testament. Don't take my word. I know y'all. I know y'all messed up out there listening to this, but hey, I just got to give it to you like it is, okay? You know, and I'm gonna deal with this a little bit in my message. How we believe stuff that we have not even stopped to validate. So do the homework. Google it. 
the Roman Piso family. Read, Google it and do, uh, get ready though. I'm going to tell you now, hold on to your girdle. <laughs> hold on to your belt buckle and hold on to your socks. Because it's deep, because when I read about the Piso papers, even though I had come into the awareness of the truth of the non-existence of a fabricated person called Jesus, it still hurt when I read it. She goes on to say here that uh, furthermore, Josephus would not be the correct spelling of his name by the Romans during the first century because J is an English alphabet. Josephus would have possibly been Yusef. And the English name Jesus would have possibly been spelled by the Romans as Jesus. Also from the Greek Jesus or Zeus. In other words, Jesus is a continued version of Zeus, who according to Greek mythology was the father of gods and men and ruled the Olympians on Mount Olympus. Zeus was also known as the god of sky and thunder. Nut was the goddess of the sky according to ancient Egyptian creations. There are parallels of gods and goddesses within all major religions systems which makes the Jesus figure the latest version of the sky deities worshipped in the ancient world. This girl did her homework. She says there was no mention by credible ancient scholars, <laughs> historians regarding a Jewish Messiah who performed miracles and raised the dead during the first century except those who forged stories to advance their own agendas. Which is what Arius Piso and his family did. Oh my goodness. The Jewish Savior God, and I'm, I'm skipping some paragraphs here because it's very long. The Jewish Savior God is also a continuation of the worship of Serapis. A Greek, uh, Greco Egyptian deity invented by the Greek ruler Ptolemy in the 3rd century BCE. There are historical references about Christians being regarded as worshippers of Serapis. In the, oh man, in the 1st and 2nd centuries, this was in the early history of Christianity. Before I read any further, everybody write this down. Um, Agora, write that down please. A G O R A. How many of you guys have Netflix? Good. If you have Netflix, I want you, when you get home, I want you to search the movie Agora. Okay? Those of you who don't have Netflix, you need to get it. And get rid of your cable. It'll save you a lot of money. I ain't trying to tell you how to run your house, but some of y'all paying over $100 a month for junk on television. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Okay, if you have the internet, you can get the news on the internet. Got me? Okay, I, I got rid of my cable and got Netflix and I haven't missed a heartbeat. I go watch the movies when I get ready and that's it. I don't have to worry about a cable bill. And guess what, y'all? Netflix is how much a month? Nine dollars a month. Ain't that better than a cable bill? She goes on to talk about, the, and the reason why I'm telling you to do this is because when you see the movie Agora, Agora actually, uh, it talks about the Christian invasion of Egypt in the fourth century. And it actually shows you how the Christian church came in and destroyed the library in Alexandria. I mean, go watch the movie. Go get it and watch it. If you don't have it, get it on DVD and watch it. How many of y'all remember me telling you about a sister by the name of, and my message I call it Hepatia, or it's also pronounced Hypatia. Anybody remember that you're talking about? How, I taught this years ago. Hypatia was, was killed by them, dragged through the streets until her skin was ripped from her flesh, her bones. You know, it, talk, it shows you how Hypatia being the great philosopher there in the library of Alexandria and the classes that she taught. It so shows you all that. But what's deep is there's this massive structure of Serapis in the opening of the movie. I said, ain't this so much? The only thing wrong with the movie is it's white folk. So it's depicting, making you think that these ancient Egyptians were white, when in reality they were black. This sister goes on to say, even the deity Serapis is a continuation of earlier deities, including the worship of Horus or Heru of Egypt, the firstborn son of Asar and Aset. The biblical Jesus is not even a historical figure. And yet millions of people continue to pledge their allegiance 
to a mythical and non-historical figure. Therefore, Christianity cannot be regarded as an authentic religious system when it is based upon ancient mythology and forgeries. I appreciate the sister taking the time to go do her homework and come to her own conclusion. It's hard to give up the lie when all you know is the lie. Y'all hear what I'm saying? But she did it. And I applaud her for that. There's an awakening taking place, and that leads to my message for today. In fact, everybody say this after me. It's time to wake up now. It's time to wake up now. Now, I, I kind of battled between two subjects. So, I'm going to make the other, like, a subtopic. The topic of today's message is it's time to wake up now, but the subtopic would be, so what must I do to be saved? There are so many of our people who are transitioning, and they want to know. People are starting to email me and ask for DVDs and CDs on how to help them through this process. I'm so glad to hear that, because an awakening is taking place. You see, brothers and sisters, for centuries, the minds of our people have been shackled by the chains of Euro-Gentile Greco-Roman doctrines placed on us by religious leaders. Now, what is the description that I just gave? Euro-Gentile Greco-Roman. Why do I give such a description? To help you understand that, first of all, Gentiles are Europeans. That's the first thing you got to get straight in your head. Black people, Africans watching me right now, stop calling yourself Gentiles. You are not a Gentile. White folk are Gentiles. So why do we call ourselves Gentiles? Because white folk taught us. Y'all grabbing what I'm saying? You see, when they brought us, kidnapped us and brought us over here, they forced their belief system on us. Even before that, as I showed you, as I told you, and showed you pictures of, of there in Ghana being in the, the, the slave dungeons, the laws that the Roman Catholic Church passed in Ghana to where it's way back then in the, in the 15, 1600s, you know, and they were forcing, forcing Africans, Africans, Africans to say that they were Gentiles. Now we love saying it. In the quest for our liberation, we must ask ourselves, is there any truth in the stuff that was taught to us? We didn't ask that question growing up. I didn't ask it growing up. You know why I didn't ask that? Because my parents taught me. And Edna Forbes wouldn't lie to her grandchild. Her sister, Allen Gilmore, would not lie to her great nephew slash son since she raised me. Clarence Gilmore, man who raised me, he wouldn't lie to me and teach me wrong. Your mama wouldn't lie to you. I'm not going to stand here and say she lied to you because that would offend you. Y'all know how we all would talk about mama. Don't talk, don't you so? All right, that's my mama you're talking about now. So let me say it this way. Your mama wouldn't lie to you intentionally. No. So the stuff that we were taught as youth growing up in religion, we didn't question it. And because we did not question it, we are messed up as we are today. You see, brothers and sisters, listen, here's how this goes. If, let's use some, let's just use some common sense. I know common sense ain't common no more. I know it. I know something has happened in, in our psyche and in the world to where common sense just ain't so common no more. But let's just exercise a little bit of simple intellectual logic and reasoning. If the God of creation 
have truly revealed him or herself, don't you think that the whole world would be able to know what it is? Why is it that there is one particular religion that says that God chose to reveal himself in the person of Jesus Christ? And there's no other religion or revelation of God except Jesus Christ. What kind of dumb stuff is that? Let me show you how God, the God of creation, has chosen to reveal him or herself. Let me help you understand this. Breathe. Take a good deep breath. Let's start right there. And realize that that stuff that you just inhaled, you didn't make it. And it's keeping you alive. But not by your power because you don't have the intellect to create it. And not only do you not have the intellect to create it, you don't have the ability to supply it to everybody. What other evidence is there to the existence of the Almighty or God? What other evidence? Look outside. Look at the trees that you did not make and your mama didn't make it either. Look at a cloud in the sky that the world's greatest scientists cannot duplicate. Look at the mountains. Look at the rivers and the seas. Look at somebody next to you and say, what he's really trying to tell us? is that creation testifies to the existence of God. God doesn't have to reveal himself through a fabricated figure of the Roman Catholic Church. Let's get it right here. And then we got these folk, you know, and this, so, 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 then, then if that's true, then, Brother Ray, if that, if what you're saying is true, and, 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 well, then, then, then what, what am I supposed to do to be saved? Because, see, that's what's been taught in our head. We want to be saved. Now, the reason why we want to be saved is so that we don't be lost. Did y'all get what I just said? Now what you need to ask yourself, Christians, is who told you you were lost? Where you get that from? When you came out of your mama's womb, you automatically became lost. According to who? That's not an African concept. When I was in, 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 in Christianity, there's this thing called the Evangelical Teacher Training Association. ETTA, those of you who are heavy in your church, you might know of this organization. I was a certified instructor in the Evangelical Teacher Training Association. And one of the things that we taught in that is before you can get a person saved, you must get them lost. Y'all getting this? So the program of Christianity and religion is to, to actually countermand your common sense. The program of Christianity and religion is to literally reverse just basic rationality in the mind of the person listening to you. So when we would go to a person and ask them, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your savior? And they would say no. Then we had to show them how much in danger they were. You see, now let me show you, for those of you who don't know about this, for those of you who watch me who don't know about this, this is a, seat, a serious deep program of the Roman church. Y'all hear what I'm saying? 
You see, the Roman Catholic Church is so bent on this that they actually made up a Bible. They made up a Bible. Write it down. So you, if you, many of you already know about this, but those of you hearing this for the first time, write this down. The Panade version of the Bible. It's called, it's spelled P-A-N-A-R-E, Panare. Now what happened is the Roman Catholic Church went into South Africa and there was a, a tribe of Indians there called the Panare Indians. So what the Roman Catholic Church did is they tried to witness to them, tried to get them saved, tried to get them to accept Jesus Christ as their savior and they wanted to know why. Why should I do this? Why, why do we need to do this? And the Roman Catholic Church said, because y'all are sinners. Now what's deep about it is in the Panati vocabulary, there's no word for sin. So how are they supposed to relate to I'm a sinner if there's no word for sin in our vocabulary? And the Roman church told them y'all are guilty. There's no word for guilt in their vocabulary. So now the missionaries got a problem. Because the missionaries cannot communicate their program to the Panada Indians and thereby, and thereby get them lost. So the Roman Catholic Church said, okay, here's what we need to do. We need to come up with, a, uh, we need to devise something and put it in place so we can reach these people. So you know what the Roman Catholic Church did? They actually rewrote the New Testament. Now by y'all, listen y'all, I'm talking about something that just happened about three decades, three, de three decades ago, three or four decades ago. When was it? 1975. I ain't talking about nothing that happened in 1312. This is 1975. Roman Catholic Church said we need to write a new version of the New Testament and call it the Panade Version. So in this version, guess what they did? They got rid of Judas. There's no Judas in the Panade Version. There is no Herod in the Panade Version. Got me? Okay, so the betrayal of the kiss and all that kind of stuff that we were taught about never happened in the Panade version. What they told the Panade Indians is that the Panade Indians killed Jesus. And that they took this man and laid him down on the ground and nailed his hands into the cross and his feet into the cross. You know, and the man hollered and screamed and cried in agony and pain and that Panade killed him and they said the man died like that. So what they had to do to show the Panade that they were on their way to hell and in danger is in the Panade version of the New Testament they said, God said, I am going to roast the Panade in the big fire. Now you got my attention. God says, I am going to kill the Panade because they killed Jesus. And it scared them so bad that the Panade Indians started saying, no, we don't want to roast in big fire. Now, in the Bible, in the Panati version, it says big fire. What's the word they gave you? Hell. hell. Thank you. Right on. They told you you're going to hell. you going to hell. Look at somebody next to you saying nothing hot about hell. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, let's do this. Everybody repeat after me. The space inside this circle. Inside, represents my realm of knowledge, realm of knowledge. All, that I I all that I think I know about whatever I think I know I is represented represent right here, here inside this circle I must keep in mind that there is more to know than what is within inside my little circle did y'all get that? I, I had to do that because I saw a couple of facial expressions when I said hell ain't none hell hot about hell. Everybody say hell, hell. is the grave, the, grave. The, hole the hole in the ground that they put your body in when you die. That's hell. In the Bible, that's hell. The actual word is Hades or the, they, they call it Hades. It's all, it simply means the hole in the ground, the grave, that's all it is. There's no heat in the hole in the ground. Trust me, because it was, when y'all would, would go to cemeteries and bury folk, you see poof, you see flame, but it don't happen like that, because there's no heat in the earth like that. Are am I making sense to you? Yes, sir. 
So let's get right to the crux of the matter. What does it mean? You know, you tell folk you need to be saved. And those of you who are watching this, I hope this frees your mind. Okay? It has to do with the term that is based in tradition. Now, let me deal with tradition for a moment. Everybody say tradition, tradition. is a good, good and bad thing. And bad. Tradition is good because it helps you to see uh, the practices of our people over a period of time. But tradition is, can be bad because it's not necessarily based in truth. Just because a people been doing a thing for a long time a certain way does not mean that it is right. I'm going to make sense to you. See, a lot of times we carry out traditions that were handed down to us. That's why it's called tradition. But what if a fool started it? <laughs> then you carrying out a foolish activity. But you think it's a sacred activity. Like communion, for example. That's a tradition. Most of the folk in the world, especially black folk who take communion, have absolutely no idea where it started from. They don't know. They, they're going by what is read when they serve communion. Y'all know how it is when you serve communion. Y'all remember them days? The table is all set out here. You got a little sister standing over here, a sister standing over here, standing like this here, their arm behind their back. You know, this whole thing, or you standing like this at the table, you know. Okay? They don't even understand. And, and because the Bible says, and the Lord, the night he was betrayed, the Lord took the, the, the bread and break it and said, take, eat, this is my body. And we believe that. Look at somebody said, that did not happen. Look at somebody said, there was no last supper. Oh, you circle up if you have to. There was no 12 disciples sitting around a table at the Last Supper. You know why? For several reasons. Number one, they didn't exist. Number two, they didn't sit at tables back then anyway. They sat on the floor. And they... So that picture you got in your house of the Last Supper, get rid of it. You need to understand what's going on here. If you look at, study that picture well, you'll see that the 12 men are divided in four groups of threes. Look at the picture. You have four groups of threes. Why? Because those are the four seasons of the year. Three, three months in each, in each season. If you look under, you'll see a, a, the four table legs under that table. Under each group of men, there's a table leg. Right, this is... I, this is astrology we're talking here. And the one dude in the middle is the sun. S-U-N. That's why there's a halo around his head. Study the picture. You got churches got big pictures of that up for communion. And folks standing there. In the church I came from, we always did it on Sunday night. So the fact that it was held at night had a different psychology on us. Because they turned off the lights. And they had a cross hanging on the wall in the back that would light up. You talking about messing with our minds? And they start singing, On Calvary on Calvary, on Calvary, here we are in the dark, <laughs> with a cross lit up on the wall at night in the back. On Calvary, see how he died. And we stand there looking at this lit cross. <laughs> Come on, man. Can, any, can anybody re remember what I'm talking about? Anybody go through that? Oh, so I got some y'all. Okay, you know what I mean. 
Yes. And then they give us that little cup of Welch's grape juice. <laughs> Had to be Welch's, couldn't be wine. Not in the Pentecostal church. Not in the church of God in Christ. Had to be Welch's grapefruit juice. Doggone it, that little tiny cup, just enough to make you mad. You, you know. And they break up these little mops of crackers. And they say, here, take, eat. And I always wanted to know why I got the smallest piece. Why don't you give me a big piece of cracker, man? You, you, want, to, you want me to remember somebody? Give me some meat, man. Well, Catholics go through that now. It's called the Mass. It's a tradition. And our folk don't even know where it originated. It originated with Ptolemy. Ptolemy the first, Eucharistos. Eucharistos, the word Eucharist. You know what happened, y'all, when they had his coronation ceremony? It's a white pharaoh. When they had his coronation ceremony, what they did is they coronated him at the ceremony and, and, the, and the, the ritual that they went through was eating flesh and drinking blood. Ask any royal archmason, he can tell you what I'm talking about. Because in Royal Archmasonry, they, we, we carried out the same ritual in honor of Ptolemy of ancient Egypt. Well, it wasn't ancient then, no way. Ain't no such thing as ancient white people. <laughs> but of course, in the Masonic order, you don't eat flesh and drink blood. You eat fried chicken and Mogan David wine. <laughs> now that's communion. <laughs> that's real communion. Yeah. So we need to get rid of these traditions that don't make sense. Like baptism, same thing. Folk honestly got this thing in their head because the Bible says repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus and wash away your sins. Everybody say Baptist church. Have y'all ever heard of that before? You know why the Baptist church carries the title Baptist? Because of that one verse in the Bible. Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. So what happens is you can't even join the Baptist church unless you get baptized or you come with a letter from another Baptist church saying you already been baptized. That's why folks used to say, I've already been to the water. In other words, I'm saying, I'm saying, I'm singing this song so y'all don't put me in that damn on cold pool again. <laughs> How many of y'all got baptized? Let me see your hands. Woo, look at the hands, all y'all. Was the water cold? Yeah. <laughs> so y'all went down to the chili joint now. <laughs> Stepped in the water? The water was cold? Chill my body, but what? But not my soul. When you, when you, when you, when you really look at it, and you and you come to understand what really is happening, you realize how foolish you were. So those of you who are watching this, please understand, okay, that. Baptism does not wash away your sins. You can get baptized in the deepest part of the Pacific Ocean. And when you come up, you are the same Negro you were when you went down. Please understand that it don't wash away nothing. So it's important to understand what most people mean when they say, I'm saved. I'm saved. That, what they really mean is I've asked Jesus to come into my life and save me from my sins. That's really what people mean. What, they, what they're saying is by faith I have received him as my Lord and Savior. Now that's some deep stuff. Look at that, man. You're actually making a fabrication of the Roman Catholic Church. You're making a doctrine your Lord. You're making a church statement your Savior. 
You're saying you've been delivered from the punishment of hell. How many of us say such like stuff like that and yet we're living in hell? Well, I, I long, long, as long as I don't go <laughs> to hell when I die. And that's the kind of stuff, questions we get. So, so what's going to happen to y'all over there when y'all die? What's going to happen to y'all when y'all die? We conscious people. What's going to happen to y'all when y'all die? See, that's the question folk ask us. And I tell people the same thing that's going to happen to you when you die. They're going to bury us or cremate us. One of the two. Brothers and sisters, my assignment is to awaken us, to awaken you who's watching this right now. My assignment is to awaken you from this lethargic stupor. It's time to wake up now. We have been ignorant and sleep for too long. That's why we are in the condition that we are in as a people. I, I hope this doesn't sound contradictory as I'm about to say this, but stop blaming the white man for you being dedicated to being ignorant. Now don't get me wrong. I know that the white man has put some serious devices in place. But one of the things I like about the Almighty and the ancestors is the Almighty loves us so much that despite the programs that have been put in place for our destruction, the Almighty keeps sending messengers and teachers to wake us up. So just because they put a program in place called Christianity or Islam or Buddhism or Judaism, just because they put these programs in place to keep us sleeping and anesthetized is not an excuse for you to refuse to think. All you got to do is think. And we don't want to do that. We hide behind dumb sentences. Like, well, the Bible says, as far as the heaven is above the earth, so are his ways above our ways and, and, and his thoughts above our thoughts. <laughs> What they got to do with you thinking? Does that mean don't think? All you have to do is think. God gave you, you Africans, you Africans who are watching this. White folk, I'm not talking to you. You Africans who are watching this. Now it's really deep. I don't have to talk to white folk because they know what I'm saying is true. Read their articles. They're telling you Jesus. They're, they're putting Newsweek magazine in search of Jesus. Because they know he don't exist. They know that already. In search of Noah's Ark. They know Noah's Ark don't exist. They're already telling you. It's really deep about it because they made up the lie, taught it to you. Now you are holding on to the lie and they're turning around letting you know we lied to you. We lied to you. And you say, no you didn't. No you didn't. You are lying. That's what we're telling you. We lied to you. Satan is a, the devil is a liar. Yeah, we know that. That's why we're telling you we lied to you. We know we the devil. What I found is when we're trying to awaken folk, they don't want to wake up. It's easy to sleep. But what's deep about it is when you sleep, you lose all sense of time. In the deep, how you go to sleep, 
and look like you ain't even been asleep that long and eight hours have passed and it's time to wake up and the clock go off. It's time to get up already. I just went to sleep. No, because that's because you lose all sense of time. You lose all track of time. You see, and it's important to know what time it is, brothers and sisters. In fact, I, I want to read a, a verse out of the Bible right quick. Uh, Minister Stewart, grab for me, uh, if you don't mind my going to the biblical text to, to show you the point I'm trying to make here. And it actually tells you right in the Bible that it's time for you to wake up. It tells you that. Romans the 13th chapter, I believe it's verse 11 and 12. Romans 13th chapter. It actually tells you, brothers and sisters, uh, let me, I don't want to misquote it, so let me just wait till she has it. Would you grab the, grab the uh, uh, microphone for her there, brother? Okay, she got it already. Romans 13, verses 11 and 12. I hope I got the right verses. What, what does it say? Notice this. Listen to this, y'all. And that knowing the time... Uh-oh, stop right there. And that knowing the time... Look at somebody say, what time is it? You know, see, why do y'all ask people that question? You say, excuse me, what time is it? If you don't have a watch on, you ask somebody, what time is it? You know, you have the time, can you tell me what time it is, please? Why do you even ask people that? The reason why you ask people that is because once you know what time it is, it helps you to control your actions. It helps you to develop your speed of movement. Oh, is, oh, is, it, that, is it that late already? Child, let me hurry up. I didn't realize it was that late. Oh, I didn't know it was that late. That's why you ask that question. So it says here, knowing the time. So I'm asking you, do y'all know what time it is? Then wasn't there a song, does anybody really know what time it is? Wasn't there a song out there, something like that? Does anybody really care? I forgot who put that, I think Chicago put that song out there. Yeah, very powerful message. Do you really know what time it is? Sometimes I wonder because if you really knew what time it, what, what, what time it is, what time it was, your, your behavior would be different. What does it go on to say? And that knowing the time, yes. that now it is high time to wake out of sleep. Whoa. It, is t it goes on to say, and now knowing the time, that now it's time to wake up. It's time to come out of your sleep state. I know you enjoy being in it. Africans, I know you enjoy being in your sleep state because when you're in your sleep state, you can dream. And when you're dreaming, you can be anything you want to be. You can go anywhere you want to go at the snap of a finger when you're dreaming. So people like that. And they don't want to wake up from that. And that's why we're dying, man. Yes, yes. Read. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. Everybody say salvation. Salvation. What does that mean? The word salvation is the root word soteria. Which means to be liberated has nothing at all to do with heaven. Has nothing at all to do with going up in the sky. So it says, time to wake up now. Yes. I said then to my said. <laughs> it's time to wake up now out of our sleep state. Knowing the time means understanding the strategic period when things are brought to a crisis. Do you realize, do you really realize that we are at a point of crisis? Yes. Black people. Yes. Yes. Things are not good for us, man. And laws have been passed to be sure that things are not good for us. What are you prepared to do about it? Do you even have a voice? Oh man, there you go. Do you even have a voice? What happens is we get together and make a lot of noise. We don't have a voice. Oh, uh, uh, that'll preach. Everybody say there's a difference between making, no making a noise and having a voice. We've confused the two. You see, if we had a voice, we wouldn't have to make noise. If we had a 
louder voice, we wouldn't have to make so much noise. I watched over the last couple of weeks how much noise we made over the shooting of Trevon. We made a lot of noise. A lot of noise. So you know what the white folks said? It said to keep them from making so much noise. Y'all ain't gonna like what I'm getting ready to say. But to keep them from making so much noise so they can quiet down, arrest the boy. Arrest him and charge him with murder so they'll stop making so much noise. Are y'all hearing me? And then after they quiet down and we go through this mock trial, we'll acquit him of his charge. That's exactly what's gonna happen. You know what? Look, you know what's gonna happen? Everybody repeat after me because the star witness for the prosecution is dead. You see that y'all got y'all gotta see how this whole thing happened, man. His lawyers didn't just quit. I mean Turk to make turn this into that, but his lawyers didn't just quit. They knew he didn't need him and he didn't need them anymore. The prosecutor said, you know what? Let's make these folks stop making so much noise. This whole thing is a setup. And we can't see that. We think we've accomplished something. We think we accomplished something. Because he's arrested and charged. That don't mean nothing. It don't mean nothing until he's convicted of a crime. So what they do? They arrested him, they charge him, and put him in protective custody. Y'all know what that mean? That mean he's safe now. He ain't got to worry, he ain't got to keep looking over his shoulder. Got him in protective custody because what they're going to do is they're going to go through this mock trial and there's not enough evidence to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. So according to the law, they have to acquit him because there's too many gray areas in this matter. But at least we stopped making noise. We're quiet now. We're quiet. In fact, his mama even said, I think, I think my son's shooting was an accident. The prosecutor talked to her. Prosecutor came on national television saying, I spoke to those sweet people. Come on, when, have you, when do you know prosecutors to call black folk sweet people? Come on, people. Let, we gotta, wait, everybody say, wake up! It's time for us to get up, man. Wake up out of this, this stupor that we're in. A state of subsilence due to intentional miseducation. That's what it means to be sleep. Not just silence, but subsilence. You don't even have a voice. You know what they do with people who don't have a voice no more. There was a young lady who they called the voice. She no longer had that voice and she was no longer an asset. So it's time for her to die. Her name was Whitney Houston. Verse 12, what does it say? The night is far spent. The night, the night. Everybody say the time of no productivity. The time of no productivity. That's what nighttime means here. It means a time of ignorance, stupidity, drunkenness, slumberness, sluggishness. That's what night means in this verse. It comes from the word nukes, N-U-X. Nukes, it means the time of not getting anything done. It's far spent. What are they saying to us? They're saying, y'all, y'all have been wasting a lot of time. You haven't been getting anything done. You look good, but you ain't getting nothing done. And it's time for that to stop now. It's far spent. What is it going to say about the day? The day is at hand. The day is at hand. Everybody say day, day. is that which dispels the night. Look how beautiful it is outside. Why? Because it's daytime. 
You can see. You can see way down the street in the daylight. Because day dispels the night. Day represents knowledge. Day represents being in the right position that you're supposed to be in. Night means that you ain't getting nowhere. Ain't y'all tired of us being at night? Yes, sir. You should be. Read the 12th verse, finish it, and I'm going to close this. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Wow. The, can y'all see this? The armor of light. Cast off the works of darkness. Again, darkness represents what? Ignorance. Darkness represents ignorance. And the armor of light. The armor of light. Are you walking in the armor of light? Have you put on the armor of light? Knowledge? Are you in search of more light? Do you really want more light? Some of us say, yeah, I want more light. No, you don't. Because acquiring more light means change. When you get more light, guess what, y'all? You know, so, so, so far, like folks say, I want to change, I want to change. But if you look at them, they still got the same people around them. They're still doing the same thing they've been doing. But yet they want change. Do you not know, brothers and sisters, that change just does not necessarily mean moving the furniture around in your house. There is no change in your life if the same people that got you where you are are still in your life. Oh, you didn't like that one. When you have change, that means that things are different in your environment. Yes. We're in a strategic period. I'm going to transliterate those two verses as I close. Brothers and sisters, we are in a strategic period in our lives. If you look at your life right now, you'll see that you are at a point of crisis. Being at a point of crisis simply means that you're at a point where you got to make a decision because you can't keep doing this. I can't keep doing this. I cannot do this any longer. Okay? Something has to be different here. From this point forward, something has to be different. But I find a lot of us are not really tired of where we are. We're not really tired because y'all keep saying, y'all, I got to make a change. I got to make a change. Something around me got to change. And then you turn around and say, I don't know what it is. <laughs> but something got to change. If you don't know what it is, then you ain't going to make no change. This is a definite time for us to get up and become productive. And the reason why we have to become productive, brothers and sisters, is again, because we don't have a voice. We don't have a voice in society. We don't have a voice in the world economic market. We don't even have a voice in St. Louis. Did y'all hear what I said? Yes. Now get me, I, I, I don't know that much about the, the city council. Uh, I used to know more about it, but I somehow another kind of, I just got so preoccupied with what I do, I kind of lost what's happening downtown. I don't even know who's who downtown now. No. But the city council, is it still majority black? I don't know. When I, when, I first, when I came here, it was pretty much a majority black city council. What is, how is it now? Oh, don't tell me y'all done lost that. Y'all don't know either? So, okay, do the black folk on the council outnumber the white people on the council? Not anymore? Okay. Whoa, that's some deep stuff, man. See, so, see, see, huh? But the majority of the council members are not black. Oh, council members, but the three people who really kind of run things. The mayor is white. That's deep. That's deep. That's some deep stuff. I remember when I came in, we had a black fire chief. 
black police chief, black mayor, and somehow or another it all got, somehow or another it all got strategically moved out, huh? Is the police chief black now? Yeah. How about the fire chief? No. How about the mayor? Well, I, mm, we know he ain't black. Do y'all see what I'm saying? Yes. Yes. We don't have a voice. And those of us who would have a voice, they don't really want us in office. Those of us who would speak out and speak up, they don't really want us in office. So it's time, brothers and sisters, for us to start doing our part. Now mind you, there's not enough of us in this room to give black people a voice. There's not enough listening to me right now to give black people a voice. You know why? Because you know what gives black people a voice? Does anybody really know what gives us a voice? Everybody say money. Now we spend more money than anybody else. But we don't put it together to give us a place at the table in economic discussions. So therefore, we don't have a voice. We, don't, we are not seen as a significant sector in world affairs. That's why they don't care about us. That's, that's why they can kill us. You don't hear about Japanese people getting shot. You don't hear about that. You let a Japanese get shot by a cop. I dare let it happen. Man, shoot, that'd be like another world war. All of Japan are being here on that situation. They ain't, they ain't gonna mess with no Japanese. They ain't gonna mess with no Chinese. No. Cause they don't make noise. They have a voice. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Yes, yes, yes. And until we start getting to the place, let, let, why don't we do this? Why don't we do this? Why don't we start trying to have a voice first in our local area? Don't worry about having a voice in, in world affairs. How about starting locally? What kind of voice do we have? We got enough black churches in this city to where nothing can happen in this city if black folks say no. You know, it's really deep. I, I, we, we had a brother, I don't know his name, after my message last Sunday. Last Sunday I did about... Uh, what was the message I did last Sunday? Wasn't it, um, if Christ be not risen, wasn't that last Sunday? Yeah, okay. We had a brother sitting over here who came to me at the service and shook my hand and introduced, he said he's a pastor here in St. Louis. And I said, oh man, you here with us on, on Easter Sunday morning? He said, yeah, this is my day to visit. I said, okay. So he, sat, he was sitting over there and he shook my hand and I was standing out here when we were raising the funds and you know what he said? He, he said, he said, Doc, he said, the things that you taught us this morning, we learned that at Western, Western Seminary. I said, but are y'all teaching it? He said, <laughs> you learned it in Western Seminary, but then why aren't you teaching it? Why aren't you teaching the truth about Easter? If you learn this in Western Seminary, I think their branch of Western Seminary right here is at Pleasant Grove, or is Pleasant Green, where Bonner is. What church is that? Pleasant Green, right? Yeah, that's where they have Western Seminary here. So the Baptist preachers go there. And they learn this in Western Seminary, but yet they ain't teaching in the churches. See what I'm saying? You know, that, that's, that's why we're messed up, man, because we, 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 we got punks among us. Our religious leaders. Keeping us in this predicament. It's time for us to wake up. And once you see that you're sitting in an... Let me speak to them out there now. Once you see that you're sitting under somebody who's lying to you, get your butt up out of there. Real simple. Leave. Leave. Why should they change? If they can lie to you and you keep on tithing. 
don't understand that, man. I, I don't understand that. Why is it that the liars are raising all the money? Don't let me get started in that one. And the true speakers can't hardly stay afloat. Because we told you the truth that you ain't going to hell if you don't tithe. Minister Hopkins told me that was a suicidal teaching when I taught that. He said, man, you shouldn't have taught that. Well, I got to tell you the truth. That I have to tell you, and hopefully the truth will sustain us. God will keep touching somebody's heart to keep financing the truth. Make a sober decision to lay aside your preoccupation with ignorance. Stop being preoccupied with ignorance. Uh, avoid people. Uh-oh, I gotta say it. People, please, avoid people in your life. Avoid people in your life who live in ignorance. And it's visible to you and their own, see here's the, when you, when you love, oh man, I gotta, 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 say, gotta say it. When you love people, you have a tendency to get attached to their weight. Am I making sense? You know that they're, you know that they're, they are weighing you down. Try to see yourself in a lake and their, their weight is about to pull both of y'all down. Do y'all remember the tragic, or, or the, 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 or what would have been a tragedy? I don't know if how many of you guys were here. We had an outing some years ago. I know you remember, right? We had an outing some years ago. And we were out there in the lake, me and Brother Wade and Brother Brady and Minister Mentor Tep, and me and, me and Brother Wade were rowing, we, and we decided to race, we were racing. And so we were rowing, 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 and of course, went to switch sides so that, you know, in a, in a canoe, both people can't row on the same side at the same time, because there's too much weight on that side, and that's what happened. And we flipped over in the water, and Brother Brady and Minister Mentuo Tep, they saw us in the water, and what was deep about it is when we went and flipped over, Brother Wade, who couldn't swim, I didn't know he couldn't swim. We was in our boat, and he's going. He grabbed, me, boom, you know, and we're and we're going down. And I had to make a decision. Now, either I got to do something to get this dude to let me go, okay, or we both gonna drown out here, okay? So what I did is I just went on down. I went down in the water, boom. Let's go down. Since you want, since you want to hold me, let's go on down. See, and when we went down, he let go. You know why? Because he wanted to come back up. <laughs> you see? So when he let me go, then I was able to come around behind him and grab him and keep him afloat until, until we got the assistance that we needed. And it was deep because, well, I don't want to go through the whole thing, but Brother Brady, and I'm wore out tired, I'm trying to hold Brother Wade up, and you know, and, and, and Brother Brady and Mentor Tep, their boat was out there, and I, wait, I signaled to them and said, y'all come help us, come help us. And, and, and they looked at us and said, uh-uh, we don't want to do that. And they kind of paddled over, they kind of paddled over, and Wade grabbed their boat, and when he grabbed that boat, he flipped that canoe. Oh man, that was that that was a day that could have been a very, very tragic day. Wow. And thank God for the sisters that was out there. Can't leave them out. Sister Dorothea was in the boat. Minister Stewart was in the boat. Minister Herndon was in the boat. Diane and Sister Triz. All five of those sisters was in a John boat. That, the top of that boat was that far from the top of the water. Because Sister Triggs weighed the front of that boat down by herself. And those five sisters paddled over to us and rescued us brothers, or we wouldn't be standing here today. So we thank you, sister. Yeah, buddy. But the point I was making is, when, you, when there's weight attached to you, hear me, when there's weight attached to you, that is non-productive weight, 
non-progressive weight. Are y'all grabbing what I'm saying? Okay, you have to do something or that weight is gonna pull you down with it. And many times it's our attachment to the weight that's getting ready to wipe us out too. The weight is usually family members pulling you down. Loved ones, boyfriend, girlfriend, but I love him. I just love the man pulling you down. But doc, you don't understand. I ain't never, I ain't never had a woman like that before. He pulling you down. Gotta let go of the non-productive weight and sing Billy Preston's song. Look at him and say, nothing from nothing leaves nothing. You gotta have something if you wanna be with me. Yeah, y'all know it. Nothing from nothing leaves nothing. Gotta have something if you wanna be with me. And learn how to dance it as you do it. Yeah, dance that hurt away. Am I making sense? It's time to wake up now. Make your life better. Stop staying where you are. Y'all hear me? Yes. Ain't nobody gonna make it better for you, but you. I was talking to a sister the other day, she said, well, I don't know, when my children grow up, maybe they'll take care of me. I said, when your children grow up, they're gonna leave you behind. That's what happens today. You see what I'm saying? They ain't thinking about you. They ought to show you, to, okay, let me leave that alone. I'm, I don't want to offend nobody. They're showing you right now they ain't thinking about you. They're putting all their weight on you. Come on, man. Live. It's time to wake up now and make a difference in your life. Look at the person next to you and say, it's my time now. It's my time now. Oh, I need you to say it like you mean it. Look at them and say, it's my time now. Oh, that was better. One more time. It's my time now. That's right. Get on up and live. I'll shake.